Welcome to the Talent Equation Podcast. If you are passionate about helping young people to unleash their potential and want to find ways to do that better, then you've come to the right place. The Talent Equation Podcast seeks to answer the important questions facing parents, coaches, and talent developers as they try to help young people become the best they can be. This is a series of unscripted, unpolished conversations between people at the razor's edge of the talent community who are prepared to share their knowledge, experiences, and challenges in an effort to help others get better faster. Listen, reflect, and don't forget to join the discussion at thetalentequation.co.uk. Enjoy the show. Right, I'm here with Daniel Coyle. Um, he just told me that it was 2010 we last met. Um, Dan, uh, welcome, great to have you here. I'm chuffed to be here. Is that what I'm supposed to say? Chuffed is, that is right? a great I'm word. Chuffed? Yeah. I'm chuffed, I'm totally well with... chuffed, yeah. And a uh, friend of, uh, a friend of all, things, uh, all things talent development, podcasting and performance, Nick Levett's all, uh, here as well. Hi, Nick. Afternoon. Um, so, we're, we're fortunate to have a bit of time with you, Dan, before you head off to do uh, Radio 2 with Simon Mayo, one of our... DJ heroes from back in the day. Well, speak, speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, so Dan, yeah, I know you're over here. You're over here promoting uh, the book. I um, have uh, been wading through it, and I'm going to describe it exactly like the talent code: mm-hmm. unput downable. Mm-hmm. Ah, <laughs> ah, good. When you said wading, I was worried. <laughs> I thought maybe it was going to be like a swamp. Well, or it, the reason it's wading is because yeah. it's one of those ones where I read through and go. I haven't given that enough attention. I've got to go back, <laughs> and now I've got to underline stuff. And yeah, yeah. so that's cool. that's been the process of reading that. Well, that means a lot coming from you. Sir. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so anyway, talk me through kind of the the journey of the book and how you arrived where you got to, and and kind of some of the some of the things that uh, you know you've you've found out really. Yeah, yeah. No, well, I mean, we've all been on teams that that are more than the sum of their parts. Like think about the best team you've ever been on. Maybe it was a classroom. Maybe it was a thing at work. Maybe it was sport. We all know that feeling, and that feeling is so powerful and so kind of quasi-magical. You know, we see it on the field, and we know it. When we walk into a championship locker room, you feel it, but what's it made of? So that's what I set out to, to answer, and it all, it all kind of started I was because I had done some work on individual talent through the talent code. How do individuals get good? But during the course of reporting that book, I kept bumping into these groups that were really – they had that feeling. There was something about them, and I remember being at, at Spartak – the tennis club has produced tons of champions, and um, I remember there was a, a, a teacher was there. Her name was Larissa. She was sort of the, the greatest teacher in Russia. And a new girl showed up on the day that I visited, and she walked in, and Larissa, the master coach, spots the girl and goes over to her. And she's got all this other stuff going on. She doesn't need to go over to this newcomer. She goes over to the newcomer, and she says, hey, welcome. I want you to do something for me. And the little girl says, what? And she says, and, and Larissa tosses her a tennis ball, and the little girl catches it. And it was like a five-second interaction, right? But in that interaction, this girl went from being a total outsider to belonging, to mm-hmm. feeling safe and connected to this incredible group. And it's like, that's probably the most important thing that happened that day. That was this incredible interaction made possible by this coach's awareness of the situation and sending a clear signal to this newcomer. And I kept seeing those moments, you know. And so for the book, I visited... Navy SEAL Team 6 and Pixar and the San Antonio Spurs and Zappos and IDEO and all these other high-performing groups. And there's, you know, we typically think about culture as a soft skill, but it turns out it's not soft. It's like there's a thing there. And, and the book is about that thing and how, to, and how to build it and how to control it uh, and how to use it to make the whole group better. So do you, so do you think somebody taught Larissa, the coach, to do that? That's a great question. Or it's just... She's a good person. Well, it's funny. She's, I don't know if it's that she's just, it looks like niceness. It looks like she's being yeah, warm yeah. and nice, right? Um, but when you look closely at it, she's being really smart. I mean, what she's tuned into are these really, this sort of grammar of human connection. There's the underlying grammar of human connection that we all experience when we walk into a new place. And she's mm-hmm. in tune with that. And I kept seeing other coaches and other leaders who were in tune with that grammar of human connection and 
you know, when you look at the science and when you look at, at what's happening in these places, it all it all lines up. What she was doing was sending a really clear signal of safety. Mm. Like, this is a safe place for you. And when you go, it, whether it's Pixar or the San Antonio Spurs, you get exactly that feeling. So whether they're finding it sort of naturally or whether they're – it's sort of like – Evolution, like they're figuring out the right solutions to this to this sort of problem on their own. I, I think good leaders just just have a sense of to, of when to do that, um, but we typically think of those leaders as being magical, like oh they're just so magical. But yeah. it's not magic. It's about delivering a signal in a really clear way. Do you think the um, and then within that, I mean, uh, on the I think there are definitely people who seem to kind of get people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but there's also um, people I think who, over the course of their life, have learned to get people. Yeah. And did you find any of that with some of the conversations that you had in some of the organisations you with that there were kind of people there that you could just sort of see that they had that idea about how important interactions with people were? Completely, completely. The the guy who really captured it best was this guy named Ed Catmull, who's the founding, for co-founder and president of Pixar. And Ed is a geek. Like he invent he was a, he was a, he was a scientist. He, he's he's really he invented a lot of the technology they use to animate films, which is why he works at Pixar and why he's the president of Pixar. But he's figured out people too. Like he's very intentional about his interactions. The, the best the best moment of that was when there were a bunch of young engineers working on a new protocol and. Ed Catmull, the president of the whole company, there's a thousand people that work for Pixar, and five of them, are, five young engineers are working on this new problem, and Ed Catmull comes over and he watches for a while, and it's the big guy watching you, right? Like, when, <laughs> when, so everybody's a little bit nervous, and at the end he says, hey, could you teach me that? Can you come by after, at the end of the day, come to my office and teach me that? It's like, what an incredible signal for him to send that completely dismantled any power dynamic and and then he turns into the student it sends a signal we're all about learning here you're not above me i care about this and i care about you um he's he's a geek but there's there really is hardware operating underneath here this isn't it it isn't an accident it is it's about sending really clear signals of connection of vulnerability and of purpose and can you teach that absolutely a thousand percent so it's really honest and authentic yes that's right it needs to be honest and authentic it needs to be and some people come to it naturally but absolutely it is i'm 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 living proof i mean i took a lot of these ideas from i'm I'm got four kids and i brought a lot of these ideas home around the around the dinner table right like you know that conversation you have with your kids where it's how was your day today right how was your day that conversation is always crappy it never it never goes in they never my day was fine yeah, yeah. No, tell me more. Oh, my day was fine. <laughs> what did you do? Nothing. What did you do? Nothing. <laughs> yeah. You didn't do anything. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You get that same conversation. Yeah. So based on watching Ed Catmull, watching these other pe- leaders work, I, I, I flipped it. I came home and I, and I started – I opened with a failure that I had today, I, you know, just something I screwed up at. And that works actually because mm-hmm. when you express a – send a signal of vulnerability, you, you give people permission to be vulnerable. So they, the kids start telling stories of stuff that they screwed up at. It turns into a great, funny conversation. That's not – it feels like magic because it's really fun. It makes dinner really bubbly and fun. But it's not actually magic. It's actually a language of yeah, human yeah. behavior, a language not made of words but made of signals. And the signals are we're connected. This is safe. The signals are I'm open with you. I'm going to share information with you, True, real information. I'm not going to BS you. And the third signal that you send is the story. Like what, what's the story that we're living? Where are we headed? Where's this going? So the book is kind of about those, you know, how to speak, if we can say that, how to behave that language. That's a better way to put it, how to behave that language of human connection and culture. You just made me think about, um, I was fortunate enough to be able to organize a conference when I was working in rugby and we had Carol Dweck come over. Oh, cool. And um, I mean, she's like the tiniest lady, yeah. you know, and I'm thinking here, here we are with these giant rugby guys and, you know, <laughs> how's this going to go? <laughs> But she's like a rock star. Yeah. And, uh, and the thing she said that resonated with me, which resonates with what you just said there, is she says, nobody comes home from work and says, you know what, honey, I had the best struggle today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but right. it's kind of what you're talking about there, That's isn't right. it? You know, it's that opening the door to actually, let's just share those, these, you know, these difficult experiences and let's, ha- and let's actually build connection That's right. through those shared experiences. But I, what's interesting for me is, is in, in so-called, in inverted commas, high-performance cultures, mm-hmm. um, 
I think instinctively people feel it's the opposite because vulnerability right. is a weakness. Right. So mm-hmm. there's a, they must do something here culturally that, right. that switches that on. So firstly, I think, is it, is it the leader signaling that it's okay to be vulnerable? Yes, absolutely. And you see that over and over again. The Navy SEAL commander, the, the guy I spent with time with for the book, this guy named Dave Cooper, who trained the troops that got bin Laden, he says the most important four words a leader can say are, I screwed that up. <laughs> Which is really interesting. It's the opposite of what I expected him to say. I thought the Navy SEALs would be all about complete knowledge, confidence, you know, and absolute certainty in what they were doing. And what he says, you know, humans are sort of hierarchical by nature. And so if you're a leader, you need to send a signal that it's okay to share. It's okay. We need, if we don't confront our weaknesses together, if, we don't, if we're not honest with the information we share, it's going to be really hard to succeed. And so him saying... I screwed that up or him saying, hey, poke some holes in this or, hey, this is just Mm. one idea. Hey, you guys are in charge. And the whole idea of leadership being what happens when the leader leaves the room is is an interesting one too because really a a good leader should be training his people to make his his job redundant, right? To give the power and the decision power to the group to make the group smart. It's not about the leader sort of holding knowledge. That that works for simple problems. Like that works – you know that, that's worked historically sort of the idea of the expert leader who's top down and and who has all the answers that that works for simple problems but the problems we face in sport and business in education they're not simple you have to build a smart group and it's still one of the problems that we, i think we face in coaching now isn't it is the coach is king yeah or queen uh and you know i've been on a course i've got a badge i must know everything and then i'm gonna download what's in my head into yours yes when actually the coach should be trying to make themselves redundant. That's right. So That's the athletes right. can make decisions and perform without the coach there. And it's still this real challenge, I think, that we face around managing the ego and the coach thinking it's about them. Mm-hmm. That's right. When actually it's not, and it's about the players. Right. It's still a challenge, I think, we find from a coaching context. Right. Right. And you see, and the optics are part of that too, when you see the, the, the TV shot of the coach on the sidelines directing traffic and, and shouting instructions and and then you really look back at, at great coaches in the past and you see John Wooden the UCLA basketball coach just sitting watching the game you know he didn't he didn't coach he didn't stand up and he wasn't a pop and jay on the sidelines trying to uh, mm. take control and sort of coach by video game controller um, <laughs> joystick coach joystick coach a joystick <laughs> coach he was, dance. yes <laughs> yeah. he was yeah. just like a read a magazine during the game coach you guys are in charge let me know how it goes and to that end you know the Greg Popovich of the San Antonio Spurs very successful organization most successful organization in American sport over the last 20 years he occasionally will do this wonderful thing where he walks away from the huddle where he calls time out the group huddles up and typically the team huddles and then the coaches join and, mm. and give them sometimes he just won't join so all of a sudden, the players have this moment of like, oh, we've got to figure this out. <laughs> like, he's not going to come tell us the answer, which is beautiful. Like, that's actually how it should be. You, the players should figure it out. Absolutely. Yeah. You talk about Popovich in the book. Yep. And I thought it was a really, for me, that was like a really fascinating, I mean, from a coaching standpoint, obviously, it's really I mean, there's lots of, the whole thing resonates in terms of uh, co- just coaching and leadership and the role of, I mean, a coach is a leader, but also, you know, in, in, in any other context, it's about groups of people Mm. but interestingly I think the story you tell about Popovich is really interesting in terms of his persona Mm -hmm. like you know what you might see if you do a load of YouTube clips around Greg Popovich right but then the bits that you don't see and I thought that was really illuminating that's right from a distance you see the grouchiest coach in professional sports red in the face Mm -hmm. yelling at his players old school military bearing military guy but when I went in for practice the first day, they had lost the night before, and so I figured it was, was going to be a tense practice. Uh, and first thing, Popovich walks in, he's carrying a plate of fruit and on a styrofoam plate, and he goes over and he kind of wrestles with the player who had missed the big shot the night before. And then, and I asked the general manager, is that purposeful to sort of all the players he could have walked over to? Yeah, that was purposeful to go reconnect with this guy. Because then he starts talking with that guy about... The, the dinner that he had arranged for that for that player and the wine that he had ordered and it turns out food is this incredible vehicle for connection on the on the San Antonio Spurs they eat together as a team more often than most families eat together they eat together all the time all the coaches go out for dinner before every single game sometimes to two restaurants a night and at the end of the year they get an album a leather bound album with the menus and the, and the wines they ordered in the in the album and then, so there's this incredible, this, this sort of connection where he's caring for his players, literally what they're putting in their bodies. And then um, they go to watch film, and 
everyone's kind of dreading the film session because it'll be a you know figure pop that should be yelling. But the film starts to play, and it was a documentary on the 1963 Civil Rights Act, ten minute CNN documentary. And then he starts asking them questions, you know, like what would you have done in that situation? You're you know what did your parents do? This is not that long ago, um, and really challenge you, intensely curious about them as a person. This wasn't about basketball. This was about life. And he took the opportunity to have this intense whole person interaction with them. Um, he's sending these signals of connection all the time, and the players feel that. And so he does two things. One of the assistant coaches summed it up nicely. He said, look, Pop will tell you the truth, and he'll love you to death. And he's able to do both of those because he's doing both of those. Like mm. they – they, you can't just go truth, 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 truth as a coach. You have to have the, the connection, the caring, um, the interest in the whole person because these two things work together. If you're going to ask someone to be vulnerable and really take feedback, you have to send a signal of safety. If I, I mean, I, I, that really came home to me, the fact that, you know, <clears throat> in that context, I mean, I think even in, you even talk about the fact that, you know, they essentially lost the NBA playoffs oh. and they had, a, they had a whole night plan, didn't they? Oh. What happened next for me was like amazing. They were about to win. They were, they, I think their odds of winning were like 99.8%. They were up by five with a few seconds left in game six of a seven-game series. And they were about to upset the heavily favored Miami Heat. Ball bounces the wrong way. Guy hits a big shot. They lose game six. And it's probably the most devastating loss any of them have ever had. They're just gutted. They are just gutted. They had planned a celebration at a restaurant nearby. Um, and rather than everyone sulk and go to the hotel... Popovich sort of circles up and says, we're going. We're going to the restaurant where we're going to have the celebration. He gets there early. He starts rearranging the tables so you have circles of this. First the team and then their family on the outside. He starts ordering wine, opening it, and he sits down. And, and the guy who was watching this is – we just got goosebumps sort of telling the story. But he's like, you could see him get over it. You could see him just look as devastated, as devastated. Nobody wants to win more than him. As devastated as anybody could be. And he takes a big breath and then he straightens up. And the bus pulls up and he goes to the door and he starts greeting guys, hugging them, touching them, high-fiving them and spends the whole night, like he calls it filling everyone's cup, like connecting. Mm. And it was a scene almost like a wedding. Like it, by the end of the night, people were – who walked in with you know, just completely as depressed as they've ever been. By the end of the night, they're laughing, joking. Their cups are filled. They come back. And it's uh, just – the general manager said it was the greatest coaching he'd ever seen. And it happened in a restaurant, which I think is just yeah, yeah, absolutely yeah. – that's where leadership happens. It, it, we, we sort of have so this where's feeling. He, where's he learned that? Wow. Wow. He is – he came up in the military. He's actually from kind of a – his family situation is not great. Okay. So in a way – and I think you find this a lot with great, with great leaders and great coaches. Like they're – there's a bit of a there's, – there's something in their background that makes them very – keen into creating a family in their team mm. right creating the family maybe they didn't have such a great family atmosphere yeah, yeah. so they're going to create that on their team so they're very very tuned into it um, so that combination of that sort of hunger to do it with this kind of military discipline you know it's like he gets over that's the phrase he likes to use we need people who get over themselves and basically be unselfish and he lives that in those kind of moments where he's able to get over his own disappointment to, to lead his team and one of the marks, one of the marks of his team, without necessarily dwelling on it, but one of the marks of his team, as everyone talks about, is actually their their style of play is based on unselfishness. That's yeah, right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. In the in the NBA, it actually costs you money to pass the ball to someone else. When you analyze salary of assists and, and points scored, me passing you the ball in the playoffs is like handing you twenty two thousand dollars. <laughs> Misaligned incentive. Misaligned incentive. So I'm not I'm not going to pass. I think I'll shoot. I think I'm going to shoot. No offense, Stuart, but I'm going to take this shot. <laughs> So in, in the Spurs, all that connection has this benefit, and you actually see it play out where they look for the extra guy all the time, and, and they, they have, they're lucky enough to have leaders. And the best thing that he does, I think, in my mind, is at the end of the year, he takes time to meet with them individually and says the following. He says, thank you for allowing me to coach you this year, mm. which is just such a simple thing to say, um, but so powerful. You know, his players are paid millions of dollars. He doesn't need to thank them, you know, but he does. And, and that's a mark of a coach who is creating the kind of safe environment where you can build a champion. So what does that look like for you? So you, we talked briefly earlier about your Cleveland Indians work and, and doing stuff at different levels in that pathway. Yeah. What kind of principles can you take from what he does there to work with those kind of novice coaches yep. that are on that talent pathway and working their yeah. way up? Yeah. What are the kind of principles that apply at a high performance 
big money end to we're still development based. Yeah. What kind of stuff do you take right. across? Right. Well, that foundation of connection really is at okay. the core of this. If you're going to ask someone, you know, coaching is hard. Mm. It is. It is a hard job, especially at the lower levels. You are not going to be paid. You are going to travel. You're going to be away from your family all the time, and so that. What we built out at the Indians and those people, I, I, when I say we, I mean they, because we've got some brilliant player development people there. They built out um, a new thing this year, which was sort of a, an orientation period where we not only got to know each other, but, but spent a day on each of the core values of the organization. And so you got to meet uh, people who are living this and veterans of the organization came in to kind of be partner ambassadors with the new people. They were paired up and it was this remarkable week of spending time valuing the relationships in the, in the mm-hmm. room and, and, and contemplating these big questions of how do we do this together? What's the best way to do? So that's something that you see is just absolutely foundational to build that connection you know, between all people in the organization um, and especially those, those people who are going to be asked to do that hard work of coaching at a, at a, at a, at not at a glamorous level, mm-hmm. but at probably the most important level of your coaching single A, your coaching double A, your coaching rookie ball um, and you're dealing with people who um, who can do a massive you're doing the most developmental work so that ends up being kind of at the at the very core of it and then you know we we, we spend a lot of time really creating conversations especially around innovation especially around sort of capturing the challenge of coaching too is that there's all this cool stuff that happens kind of on the periphery of your vision you know the there's coaches that are inventing brilliant stuff out there that, but is there a platform to capture that mm. and is, are they incentivized to share it like coaching can be um, self-centered like if I have a brilliant drill what is my incentive to share that with you exactly yeah, yeah. should I keep that to myself so you really need to create a conversation around this idea like look we're going to capture stuff on video we're going to capture this. we're going to write it down we're going to capture our daily activity together and if you're doing something cool on field six and you're doing something great on, on field eight, you guys need to have a conversation about that. And so that is another sort of foundational thing and it's around sort of capturing best practices and ideas and giving people space to innovate. Mm. It's interesting, isn't it? Because um, you talk about, again, misaligned incentives. Um, I always think that's a, a really interesting thing around the community and coaching. Yeah. And it, this can happen on a micro level within, a, say, a club or an organization, but it happens on, you know, on a broader level as well where... Um, the, the assumption is mm. when you're starting out that the more knowledge you have and the more drills and exercises and all those sorts of things that you have, the better you are. Yeah. And actually, if you keep those to yourself, then you've got your USP and then all of a sudden you become very proprietary about that information and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Then what you realize is you get more expert is something Guardiola talks about. He says, great coaches are great thieves. So they're, they're just stealing ideas and then they're using different thoughts. They're getting from anywhere. Yeah. So they might not get them from somebody in the same concept. They might, oh, I'll go and watch basketball. I'll go and see some. I'll go and see baseball. I'll go and see golf, whatever. And I'll pick something up and I'll take it away and I'll try try it. And then what you begin to realize actually is, is that everyone just did that from the outset. We'd all just be way better off. Yeah, right. That's because <laughs> actually about there it. are no secrets. Yeah, that's right. That's right. There really aren't. There no, really aren't. No. We, I, I think one of the... One of the challenges in, in, for, for some sports in this country is it's a, it's a competitive market and they're not going to share what they do because they think that's what makes the difference. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got this, you know, I worked at a club previously where we had a physical movement program that was brilliant. And and I'm saying, well, let's tell people about this because it's awesome. And they're like, oh no, we can't tell anyone. I'm like, well, you're kind of missing the point because the person that makes this amazing is the person that does it. And he works for us. Yeah. (laughs) So so because it's him as a person and the connection with the kids that makes this incredible. That's right. this particular exercise on a bit of paper that you know anybody could look at that that's exactly but it's right. him as a person and but we, it's very much a competitive forces that we don't want to share right when actually we'd all be better off if we do right and the sooner we realize that the magic happens in that space between the player and the coach like Absolutely. that's that space yeah. that the person who can navigate that and and drive that that's where the that's where the real power is yeah yeah absolutely it comes back to that whole point around the, the so-called hardware and software mm. so people the assumption is that um if I get Nick's um, play at physical development program, that's all I need. Yeah. Uh, if I've got that, yeah. then the magic will happen as well. Right. <laughs> but actually, there's an important interaction component <laughs> there, which is about the deliverer. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think that that's the bit that I think everybody kind of misses. And yeah. I, I don't think it just applies in sport. I think it applies in organizational cultures as well. Because again, you know, if we've got the best product, 
if we've got the best supply chain, right. if we've got the best this, that, and the other. But then you forget that actually there are people you might need to tell people about it <laughs> that's right <laughs> exactly right one, one of the biggest challenges that we certainly hear from from grassroots coaches in different sports in this country is well i watched uh, jose Mourinho do this on youtube yeah why doesn't it work with my under nines <laughs> well i mean maybe because jose's not working with under nines and yeah. you're not jose uh, <laughs> right I, I mean there's a slight challenge in there yeah but it, it's one of the challenges that we certainly have of coaching that's right yeah. that's right to have a clear model of what you're doing and how to how to go about it and it is, it is an amazing, it's a cool moment too because I think there's so much opportunity for growth in that area. There's so much tradition and so much legacy um, that that battle between innovation and tradition and bringing in new ideas versus valuing what really does work. There are some pieces of tradition that are powerful and useful. How open-minded do you find American sport to somebody like yourself that might not be an ex-professional player, therefore yeah. you know nothing because you haven't played 700 games. Right. Uh, how, how open-minded do you find to, to, to American sports to come and listen and take on board, but with a willingness to change? It depends. It depends. I okay. mean, you've got sort of layers to it. First, you've got sort of teams that are interested and teams that aren't. And there are a lot of teams that aren't. They're, they're, but there are teams that are keenly interested in this. And then the next, if you get that interest, um, and the vehicle tends to be questions, you know, right before every Major League Baseball game. 4.30 for a 7 o'clock game. They bring somebody our age out, and he stands on the mound, and he throws 65-mile-an-hour fastballs down the middle, and all the players hit home runs. All of them. All of them. Even the, the, the like little infielders are just crushing the ball. <laughs> and it's this great comfort food that happens before the game. So if you walk up to that cage and you ask, Does this, this is great. I'll bet it makes you comfortable. Does it make you better? Like, is this yeah, a way to train? Why? Like, if you had yeah. a brain surgeon who is practicing brain surgery by cutting sandwiches, <laughs> that's essentially what this is, right? It's not – there's no point in a game where somebody's going to put a fat pitch over the center and put it on a tee for you. That's not going to happen. So you're, you're practicing in a way that is, it does not reflect what is going to happen in the game. So asking a question like that could be really powerful. And if people are ready to hear that – so then you get to the next level, which is behavior. Are people actually willing? And sports is so – the thing that I've sort of realized, sports is so intently social um, that teams that do things differently, the most powerful thing is when the other team crosses their arms and looks across the pitch and says, what do those guys do? That's weird. <laughs> like, and, and the other coaches who maybe don't have a ton of uh, support, maybe they're on the road, maybe they're up by themselves, um, they have to kind of justify and defend that innovation. Mm. So the, in, in sports that are so intensely traditional, if somebody all of a sudden came out and warmed up for a soccer game with, with balls that were twice as small as, as regular balls, everyone would flip out. <laughs> and so getting past that is sort of the next challenge and the real challenge. Of course, you know, it's an innovation race and people who have success with that, pretty soon everybody would be copying them and, and doing that. So it's like any other field where something is laughed at at first, right? That's the first mm -hmm. thing. And then kind of watched quietly and then, then, then copied. It's interesting, I think, um, to talk about culture and how, again, innovation or, you know, kind of challenging culture. I think this is the bit that organizations, because obviously human beings, we love to get just back to homeostasis, don't we? You know, we want to get back to where we're comfortable. We're happy to go outside of that for a bit, we want to get back to come. But I think this is what high performance cultures kind of always know is that, that, you can never be in that space. You can never be in a position of comfort. So if the, the minute you start to feel comfortable, you have to you have to destabilize things ever so slightly. Yeah. Talk about safe uncertainty quite a lot. Is that right. a, is that something that y you would say that you've resonated with within the various organizations you work in? Completely. With? And the All Blacks were the ones who put this most clearly, I think. It's when you're at the top of your game, change your game. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really powerful way to think about that, that, it, that there is a, especially with success, um, but there is that desire to go back. So constantly and being very explicit about that as a value to say that, look, this is at the very bottom. These aren't athletic contests. They're learning contests. You know, they're really learning contests. And if you're in a learning contest, you better make learning one of your core values because if you don't, you will be left behind. And we see that in sport all the time, this team that succeeds for a little while and then Success is really hard to handle, you know, and so they fade back. But to see some uh, organizations like, like the All Blacks, like the San Antonio Spurs, who do it for year after year, decade after decade, um, it's because they are in that space of comfortable discomfort. Yeah, challenging themselves all Discomfort? The time. Comfort? <laughs> I don't know how to say that, but both at once. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and they 
understand that um, the and it, it's interesting because this is something else I think comes through in the book as well is, is that it's not always nice no right that was surprising to me I sort of thought it was going to be seashells and unicorns and rainbows <laughs> it's not it's not man excellence is edgy and so to have that you know it's 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 a type of, of it's addictive it's really fun it's deep fun um, but it's not sort of warm and fuzzy all the time. The idea, what, what you find a lot of times are people in these type of top performing cultures, they kind of love, hate it, you know, and it, it's, it's, they love it, but they're part of, but it's, it's difficult and it's, and it's hard. And so they might, maybe they would quit for a while and then they come back because they can't get that fix or that fun or that, that deep engagement of solving really hard problems with a really cohesive group. That is rare in life. You know, we all can pick probably times in life where we've had that and, it might not be the sort of happiest environment. Not you know, it's not not happy to be on the San Antonio Spurs. It's not lighthearted, um, but it is this level of like deep engagement and absorption that you don't find anywhere else. Mm. You mentioned um, uh, one of the things that resonates with me on that one is you talked about groups of people solving problems together, mm. and I think for me that's the very essence of a sports team. Yeah, you know, it's a group right. of people come together. There's some other people over there who are going to chop us, stop us from achieving our goal, right? Um, and we're going to have to work it out. Yep. And there's some people on the side here who, in in training beforehand, are going to try and help us. Yep. And they, on the sideline, though, um, you know, it's interesting how somebody like Michael Chaker, who's the Australian coach, he talks about you know, his weekends are his day off. Hmm. Work's done in the week. Yeah. Once they get over the white line, it's, forget huh. it. There's yeah. nothing I can do really. <laughs> I can it's... throw the odd person on and off, but in yeah. reality, it's up to you guys. Yep. And the All Blacks are interesting as well because they talk about, you know, they often have on a, on a Friday, it's entirely player-led. Isn't that fantastic? And they do it, and they do it once. Ugh. We don't get it right once. We don't do it, we're not doing it again. Is that right? Once. One time. One talk time. about game-like. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Incredible. Yeah. And it makes Incredible. me think about those, when I was thinking about those 65 mile an hour fast balls yeah. or slow balls, yeah. everyone's knocking out there. It's not quite the same, is it? That's more of a, let's, have, let's make everybody feel good. Feel good. It's not performance. Nope. 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 But you can go back in time too, and it, that is so. Having, having the players, having the players run is such a powerful thing, and it goes. It cut, most coaches would be allergic to that. Yeah. yeah. What am oh, I? What am I going to yeah. do? Yeah. But yeah. that idea that it really is their job, and it's really your job to equip them, and then and then to step back and let them handle it, which is hard to do. It takes a lot yeah. of self control and a lot of discipline to do that. But that's what's going to make a good team. The, one of the things I think people often forget about that, though, is particularly in a coaching context, is. You actually have to give the I say give. You have to offer or be a give is actually give the players the tools mm-hmm. to be able to do that. That's right. Because it's not natural necessarily for them to lead, particularly if they've always uh, been led by someone. Yeah. Been mm-hmm. told what to do. Yep. Look to the sideline. What shall I do now? Yeah. When you stop, you know, I've been through this process where I thought, oh, that's the don't want to do that now. I want to empower my players. Mm-hmm. Right over to you then. Yeah. They don't know what to do. They don't know what to do right away. <laughs> right, right. You got to prepare them. You got to have conversations on the side with them to get ready. I'm going to do this during the game. Absolutely. Give them a preview. Give them the answer key. That's one thing coaches don't do often enough. I think they sort of withhold mm-hmm. um, a little bit. And what I've seen effective coaches do right away is like, all right, here's here are my expert. Here's what what it is going to take to be successful. Here's what here's the answers to the to question. At some point. In this game, I'm going to turn my back, and you guys are in charge at that point. And let them know. Don't surprise them. Let them know. We had a coach speak last week at one of our events who's a, a netball coach. So net, uh, if you, netball is basketball without the running, basically. Okay. Yeah, you can't dribble it. No, there's the running. No dribbling. No, yeah, you can't. You've got stand and chuck it. Just before you get hate mail from every netballer in the world. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, and she was at the European Championships. She was the under-21 national coach. Uh, sorry, no, the World Cup it was. World Cup, under-21s. And... When they got there, all of the staff, except the physio, came down with neurovirus and ah. were quarantined in their hotel room for four days. Jesus. So talk about having to be player-led. Yeah. It was a good job she created the environment that players, I think this is down to you because yeah. there's no other option. <laughs> there's no other way. Yeah. Coaching staff is dead. Absolutely. But, yeah. but what she was really cute about was she planned that the players take ownership and there's a time now when they've got no choice. Yeah. They have to take ownership. They have to lead it. They have cool. to try it. Yeah. But I think that goes down, all the way down to the, the pathway. And I, I did it with some, some kids that I used to work with, an academy group of kids. So they were selected under 10s at a professional uh, Premier League football club. 
And I said to the kids before the game, right, you're doing everything. You're going to take the warm-up, you're going to decide the tactics, you're cool. going to choose the substitutions. Incredible. And I'm just going to sit down on my chair and watch, because that's yeah. what I do. How did they react? Well, the kids were fine, but it's not parents, the kids that's the issue. flipped out. Yeah. Ah, so I had to go over to the parents yeah. and say, look, what you're going to see is we'll probably be 5-0 down in about three minutes, Yeah. because this is why. But you'll see learning unfold in front of you. Cool. And this is why. And, and like you said, sometimes it's, perhaps priming that at a younger age group so the kids are then used to it mm -hmm. when they get to high performance level that they can take responsibility when they step over the white line. Yeah. They can solve the problems and that the coach thinks, I can step back yeah. because it's not about me. That's right. And it all kicked off, didn't it? Steve, what's his face recently that didn't join in the huddle Steve and let Kurt. Steve Kerr and let the players. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. And everyone thought, oh my God. I'm like, well, that's just coaching. That's it? coaching. Yeah, right. like, the response to that was pretty illustrative, I think, of Incredible. what we're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> Incredible. Yeah. Right. Well, it's funny. Steve Kerr, an assistant coach with the San Antonio Spurs, were both part of a league when they were in middle school where middle schoolers would coach teams of younger players, where they would just, who's the coach? It's this kid who's just like you, who's better, that you look up to. Yeah. And both of these, two, two of the best coach, Chip England is one of the guys' name. He's the best shooting coach in the NBA. And Steve Kerr, they were both, they both, that was their first experience of coaching, both as a player, to say, I'm looking up at a, my player, the, my coach is this kid, and then actually being a coach. And it works both ways. I think there's a huge opportunity there as to think about who the best coach is for a team. A lot of times it's a, it's a kid, right? Let them, let them be a coach and then let the other kids look up to them. He, you talked about coach development <clears throat> earlier on, and I think this is one of the things that's, um, again, a, a difficult thing around working with coaches to get them to understand this. And this is why I think it needs to be done with, um, you know, somebody by your side, you know, kind of yep. like seeing the problems as they emerge yep. and kind of asking the right questions at the right, because there's learning moments all the time. Right. And if you're there for those learning moments with somebody, right. then you can help them sort of reflect on those learning moments, sort of yep. think about what might they might do differently another time, or maybe reinforce the fact that... So I was uh, <clears throat> working with a coach not long ago. He had a really difficult session. Um, nothing really went right for him. And, um, and he, he was doing everything he could because I was there. I was mm. there to watch, you know. He hasn't been watched before. So, of course, he's not used to being vulnerable. Yeah. So beforehand, I'd, like, done all the piece around, you know, like, hey, I'm just another coach here to watch you. Yeah. You know, right. don't think I'm here to assess you. I'm not here to assess you. Right. Just another coach here to watch you. Right. I might see some stuff that might be of use to you, and I'll share that with you. Cool. I'm not judging you. But anyway... Needless to say, you want it to go well. Yeah. So he wanted it to go well. So he was doing everything. He was like trying to change things. He was moving it on. He was huddling up and all these sorts of things. Anyway, we got together afterwards and we just on the phone chatting away about it. I said, I, I think it went, well, I was really, oh, I don't, yeah, I, don't know. I thought it was really good. And he was dead. Take, I could tell he was really taken aback. Huh. Mm. And I said, do you know what I thought was really good about it? It was really difficult. Hmm. It was a struggle. Yeah. Now, it was supposed to be a struggle. Why? Because you were putting a new thing in there for these players to work through. Yeah. They're not going to get it straight away. Right. Mm. So your expectation was that they would just get it and move on. Yeah. But actually, it was the struggle that was the value. Yeah. So the only learning moment for him was he needed to be happy and more comfortable with the struggle. That's a big moment. Oh, yeah. my God. Yeah. Super cool. Right. Wish we could all. But if I wasn't there, I couldn't have seen that. Right. You know? Right. right. This is the point. He, shoulder he's to shoulder. Gone away. Exactly, yeah. Right. So, right. it, so then in your journey of the, of, of the book and books plural, I guess, what, what's the best mistake you've made? Wow. Um, the best mistake I've made. Well, that's a Nick Levesque question. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Sorry he's about good, that, isn't right? he? <laughs> he's you don't good. get an easy ride on this podcast. No. <laughs> no. I, 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 get to, I get the advantage. The nice thing that, about being a writer is that you get to capture your mistakes. And so my mistake, my mistake is probably about a manuscript that's about 10 feet tall because I wrote these books and they were bad. You know, the first drafts were quite bad and I didn't understand it conceptually, didn't understand the reporting, didn't understand the science. And I'm able to kind of iterate on those mistakes over and over again and, and figuring them out very slowly. Um, and so uh, all of those end up being kind of the roadmap to, to what you end up with in your hands. But what you end up with in hands looks thought out and smooth and perfect mm. it ain't it ain't thought out it, it was very 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 rough that's why i write a book every 10 years that's 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 <laughs> the schedule talent code was 2009 this is 2018 <laughs> so every nine years uh so it just it just takes an incredible amount of of time and and energy and iteration to sort of figure out what's there to look underneath the surface to really figure out what the where the book is and i get you have to i guess you have to get comfortable yeah. with the idea that 
it's not going to be uh, it's, it's the first thing's never going to be the right thing oh. you're going to have to get some feedback you're probably yep. going to have to feel uncomfortable oh, with some of that feedback oh my god it's brutal it's brutal to sort of go back and look at some of those early drafts oh, yeah it's not pretty <laughs> mm. so, so this is where I think I think schools could be better so when you, if, when you go into a, a primary school or a secondary and you see like the the poem laminated on the notice board that mm. you know that some nine year old kid's done or a vase that they've drawn and they go right. This this is dinner. This is it. Yeah. You know, I don't want to see that. I want to see the the, the eight crap ones before. Isn't that true? Where, yeah. where they've scribbled out words because it didn't rhyme with that one, and that sentence was too long, or that vase was a bit lopsided, and yeah, that's the that's the learning bit, isn't it? Yep. That's what you want to see. Is yep. that journey, not just the end bit. Mm. Absolutely. And that's one of the cool things about living in, in this day and age where we can share information. There's all kinds of cool stuff, even on writers. Like you can get – go look up J.K. Rowling's outlines for her books. Like you can see her, the outline, how she built each character oh, and where it fantastic. fits in. Handwritten, cross outs, like all the architecture underneath the shiny finished product is available in a way that it never has been before. You can go back and look at – early drafts of Darwin's work and it's there with our Dickens right da, 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 da. you can see it and so that can be incredibly powerful to share around in the same in the same way that you know it's powerful to share with with, with athletes watching the Winter yeah. Olympics there's a new generation that has had their whole life captured on, on on video right and you see them making their first slalom turn as a little kid and they're bad mm. it's incredibly exciting uh, I think for people in our world to be able to sort of share that kind of video to say here's a kid eight years old skiing he looks like any other kid and right now he just won the gold medal at, at that same event so really taking away you know knocking back some of these you know sort of myths of natural talent and putting the focus where it belongs which is on the process wouldn't it be great if we had a load of coaches that could do that that could then share how many mistakes that they've made yeah. to, to get through to knowing more right right it'd be pretty awesome if you had coaches that could think like that as well totally share there and I think that's for me is um, my big thing about the, the book is that you've got lessons in there and stories from a range of different contexts you know you're talking about business tech companies mm-hmm. you've got some stuff from sport you've got stuff in a range of different environments uh, but the thing for me that came came back was you, you're always bringing it back to these key themes. And I really like the way you've structured it, by the way, um, with the idea of the takeaways at the mm-hmm. end and all mm-hmm. those sorts of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, the thing I like about that, though, is is that each of the stories has you know has got an element of whatever it is you're talking about, belonging or vulnerability, mm-hmm. these sorts of themes. Um, and so every single time, for me, I was like, so this comes back to in my context. So we might be learning a story about. Zappos, yeah. But actually, there's a takeaway here for me in whatever. Inv- so if I'm working with the t- my team here at work, mm-hmm. there's something for me here. Yeah. Uh, next time I'm at the dinner table with my kids, there's something <laughs> for me here. Um, but next time I'm out there working with the kids, you know. Yeah. Am I doing? And have I, I reflected on it? You know, I was on the on the flight home. I was reflecting on it, and I thought to myself, Have I been doing enough to create connection and belonging hmm. with? Have I been vulnerable enough mm-hmm. with the group I'm working with? Yeah. No. Yeah. So that's the, the big takeaway for cool. me. Cool. <laughs> I'm so glad. Thank you. I'm glad for that. Uh, it's, but it feels to me like, um, I, I, I bet you didn't originally write the book for this purpose, but it feels like it follows on from the talent code so well. I don't know whether that was deliberate or not. because Yeah, I, part of that just follows my interests, I think. I always look for big mysteries to dig into, and that's a big one. You yeah. know? But uh, they, do, they do sort of, you know, you've got the individual and you've got the group, and they both have got, there's a thing under there. It's not magic. It looks like magic. Feels like magic is not magic. <laughs> well, I know I look, we could, I could talk to you for a long, long time, and we're under a little bit of time pressure because you've got to go and spruce up for your, your big show on the BBC. <laughs> um, but hey, Dan, I, I'm really glad you know it's not you've not been long off the plane. You're taking the time to come and speak to Nick and I and answer Nick's difficult questions. <laughs> yes, sorry, sorry that was that. a nightmare. By yeah. <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> um, all the best with the book. Where Thank can you. people get hold of it? And I know you're you're, you're back blogging after a little bit of a yep. hiatus. Yeah, a little hiatus back trying to compete with you. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, no, it's they can find it on Amazon.co.uk. Would that yeah. be the right one? Well, nicely or, done. Nicely or done. Com, yeah. whatever, yeah. whatever, whatever preference you have. But um, yeah, it's out there. It's out there. Brilliant stuff. Or go to DanielCoyle.com for uh, other stuff. It's um, yeah. I, I, I'll I'll. Uh, I'll embarrass you again, but um, genuinely, uh, the talent code was career-defining for me. Started me on a journey of learning 
it resonated really close and, and then now I'm doing work around leadership and all those sorts of things again it's like it's like you've brought out basically the manual for, for the next five years for me so I'm very appreciative and uh, and thank you once again you're welcome thanks for having me So there you have it. Fantastic conversation with Dan there. I am um, so glad he could, we could make it work. He was in a flying visit through into London and we managed to find some time and we were able to get it done. So um, it was also great to have Nick with me. We were, we were kind of riffing off each other, firing in the questions and, and Dan was just sort of uh, almost like, you know, playing a bit of ping pong. Um, it was, uh, yeah, really enjoyed the conversation. Uh, Nick and I then went on to um, do a coach development session with uh, a group of guys down at the, the Harlequins Academy, the Harlequins Rugby Academy, and um, we had a really good conversation about vulnerability and failure and connection and all those sorts of things, really open, and the guys were just really sharing some of their experiences and um, <clears throat> was all kind of stimulated by that conversation with Dan, so uh, really really valuable in lots of different ways highly recommend getting the book I've, uh, I've i've flown through it and it's um it's one of those things that will always be an ever present i think i'll always go back to it whenever i'm i'm looking at situations where culture and and how we can create great team environments and, and i think you know va vast majority of coaches out there are, are trying to do something like that so uh, it'll definitely resonate with them um uh, hoping you're uh, you're having a great time. You're hoping you're picking up on the on the podcast as always. Um, you know, uh, I, I'm uh, uh, I'm very very happy to always receive your feedback, any emails, any ideas, any people that you want me to talk to. I'd be definitely interested to hear from that. I quite often get people making suggestions, and, and it's always great to hear some of the things that are going on out there. Uh, some uh, some fantastic conversations being had with uh, with a lot of different people. Um, so. Um, uh, by all means do that also uh, really great to get any reviews on iTunes um, be great to uh, uh, let other people know that what the podcast is all about and share it with them uh, the audience is growing and it's brilliant um, and uh, you know just keep reaching out to different people and hopefully we can we can help make their their coaching a little bit better each week um, also if you want to support the show um, you know keeping Keeping the uh, keeping the lights on, so to speak, uh, making sure I can manage some of the, the costs associated with running it. Then head over to the website and have a look and click on the Patreon button in the corner, and then you can uh, you know you can you can support you can support for as little as as, as the price of a cup of coffee. Although today I had a very expensive cup of coffee in one of those trendy coffee shops, so maybe not as expensive as that. But you could also go at the support level of a, what expensive coffee, uh, or you might even want to join in onto the onto the conclave. Um, I've got a, a mastermind group with some intrepid coaches who are who are doing some learning there are a few places open um so if you're interested in joining us and uh, and getting together online to discuss our challenges and share our solutions then uh, you could you could sign up at the conclave level and join us uh, in the meantime hope you're having a great time uh, hope you have uh, have some great coaching wherever you are and we'll see you next week <laughs>